Over the past 12 episodes, we've seen how the Catholic Church built Western civilization. But where is Western civilization going? What's next? What can we do about it? Join me today for The Catholic Church, Builder of Civilization. Welcome to the Catholic Church, Builder of Civilization. I'm Thomas Woods. This is our last episode. So let's take a moment and take stock of what it is that we've seen thus far. Because I think when you put it all together, it's a pretty impressive package for the Catholic Church after all. For instance, we went after the subject of science right away because there I think people are most likely to disparage the Church or to think not especially well of her that she has not distinguished herself very well when it comes to science. But to the contrary, we've seen that modern historians of science, who would know something about this, they do this for a living, are now no longer saying that about the Catholic Church, that she's just an enemy of science. We've actually seen that the Church, in fact, introduced into our civilization critical ideas that made it possible for science to develop. In fact, it's not just a coincidence that science developed in a largely Catholic milieu, in a world that was formed by Catholic ideas, but rather it makes perfect sense, as we saw earlier. Beyond that, we looked at great priest scientists whose names have been forgotten, but who achieved great things in the sciences. And at that time, I urged people, and I, I renew that urge today, to consider learning more about and even writing about the Jesuit scientists these people accomplish so much in the sciences, it's absolutely astonishing. And yet, no book about it? That is an injustice, my friends. Let's hope that it's rectified. Or how about charity? We all know the Catholic Church does great charitable work. But do people realize how great it is? Do people realize that there was nothing like Catholic charity in the ancient world in terms of the amount of charity that was done or the spirit in which that charity took place? Nothing like it. The idea that I'm going to give something to someone purely out of a desire to help that person, with no self-interest involved, but simply out of love. This is a revolutionary idea. But we take it for granted, don't we? When we hear that somebody's been charitable, that's exactly what we think about. That the person did something without any thought for his own welfare, but did something solely to help somebody else. We think of that as being charity. But why does that come naturally to us? Why do we think of that as charity? Well, it's because we live in a civilization that still bears the residue of its Catholic influence. If we were living in ancient Greece and Rome, we wouldn't have these ideas about charity. So people go through life thinking this way about charity, never even knowing that it's their Catholic inheritance that has given them those ideas. Well, we should point that out, shouldn't we? But then there's the university system. Who gave birth to the university system in the high Middle Ages? The Catholic Church. Who made that possible? Who fostered it? Who protected it? And who encouraged the kind of vigorous, rational debate that occurred within the precincts of the university? Of course, it was the Church. In fact, the Church encouraged the asking of questions. The whole tradition of scholasticism consists of asking questions and being certain that recourse to both authority and reason can resolve these questions. There was a confidence in the cathedral school at Chartres and in a great many other Catholic thinkers that God had not given us our rational natures in vain, but he intended us to use them. We should use our rational nature. We should use our reason to understand the world around us, and that reason properly applied will not mislead us. We've also seen that the idea of rights comes out of the Catholic Church, too. Now, this, for a long time, has been assumed to be a teaching that comes from secular thinkers or non-Catholic thinkers, at the very least, perhaps in the 17th century, a little before, a little after. But we've seen that, in fact, the idea of rights, natural rights, rights that inhere in us as human beings naturally, 
rights that mean that you can't invade my person, you can't kill me, you can't steal from me. These things that inhere in us as human beings, these ideas developed out of the Catholic Church and her own canon lawyers. And here I rely on an important book by Brian Tierney, who's one of the great experts on the idea of rights. He has a great book called The Idea of Natural Rights. And it's there where you see the most systematic refutation of the idea that rights just came out of nowhere in the 17th century. He shows that they came out of the heart of the church. Now, we've also seen that international law comes out of the Catholic Church, too. International law, which is closely related to the idea of rights, comes out of the Catholic Church. Because international law says that some countries don't have more rights than others, but that each state has an equal dignity, regardless of whether the ruler of that state is Catholic or non-Catholic. If his only crime, so to speak, is being non-Catholic, you can't just depose him for that, because his state has dignity and the right of self-government, just the way as any Catholic state would have, or state populated by Catholics. So international law, the idea there's an absolute moral standard that governs the interaction of states. Where does this come from? It comes from the Catholic Church with Francisco de Vitoria and Francisco Suarez and de Soto and all these other thinkers. Even law itself, law domestically, is indebted to the Catholic Church because the canon law was the first modern legal system in Europe. Because for the first time, church law was brought together systematically and presented in a coherent whole where all contradictions that might have existed have been reconciled. That's what modern states in Western Europe did when they were developing their own legal systems. They used the model of canon law as to how you go about doing that. Now, in our first episode, I made brief mention of the study of economics. Now, economics really is an interesting science, so I don't want to hear any objections to economics. But economics is often thought to have emerged in the 18th century. In the 18th century, sort of deistic thinkers, or thinkers who certainly weren't Catholic, just suddenly came up with the idea of economics, just kind of poured out of their heads. But in fact, that's not what historians today are saying. For the past half century, historians who write about the history of economic thinking are now saying that it's not Adam Smith in the 1770s who just gave birth to economics, just came all out of his gigantic head, but instead, they're now pointing to a people called the late scholastics who were Spanish thinkers. Well, they weren't all Spanish, but the best ones were Spanish. So all you Spaniards out there, congratulations. As the source of modern economic thought, the late scholastics are really the source. One of the great 20th century economists, Joseph Schumpeter, said, it is they who come nearer than does any other group to having been the founders of scientific economics. And there's been much scholarship written about this ever since Schumpeter wrote in the 1950s. Modern historians of science have continued to uncover the critical and important insights into economic thought of these people. For example, Raymond de Ruver, Marjorie Grice Hutchinson, and scholars who are still alive like Alejandro Chafuin and Harry Verizer at the University of Detroit. This is, this is an important contribution as well. Now let me give an example of what I mean here. In the 16th century, when precious metals coming from the New World began to reach Europe, people noticed that prices rose. So what they recognized was there was a kind of a fixed cause and effect relationship going on here, that there was a relationship, some kind of a relationship, between the level of prices and the amount of money. So in effect, this was like an economic law. So they understood scientifically that there were relationships at work in the world of economics. This is an essential breakthrough. They also wrote great moral treatises relating to economics. Like Juan de Mariana wrote a fantastic treatise denouncing inflation when governments inflate the money supply and thereby make each unit of money worth less. He denounced this as a terrible, inexcusable crime. Kings used to call in the coins in their realm and then clip them and save some of the metal and then return the coins to the people and, of course, he's gained an awful lot for himself, and they're stuck with these crummy coins they have to exchange at the old value. Juan de Mariana denounced this because he understood the economics behind it. Now, how did this go unheralded for so long? How, 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 why for so long did we all think Adam Smith had a gigantic Why for so long did we all think Adam Smith had a gigantic head? Like, why did we think this? In part, it's because 
the people who wrote this stuff, the late scholastics, they didn't write books on economics for the most part. They wrote great moral treatises. And in the course of their moral treatises, they referred to economic topics. But they never had a book that said, here's our stuff on economics. So it was easy to overlook it. In addition, they wrote in Latin. And by and large, scholars today, particularly in economics, are not known for reading Latin. And so this was simply forgotten. And only now are we digging it out and saying, Catholics did this too. It's unbelievable. So I would say that we put this all together, and we haven't even talked about art and architecture. I assume that's taken for granted. The Catholic Church built Western civilization. And yet, not to beat a dead horse here, but this is one dead horse that amply merits a substantial beating. The European Union Constitution refuses to acknowledge the Catholic inheritance. Not a word. Western civilization comes from the ancient world, the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, and that's it. And whatever happened in between, uh, nobody really knows, couldn't possibly have been very important. I, seriously, only an imbecile could believe this now, given all the evidence that's out there. But this is what we're told by the European Union. And it can't just be ignorance. It isn't just that they're, they're dummies and they haven't done their reading. It can't be that. Because nobody who would presume to make a statement officially on behalf of the European Union could be that uneducated. It's frankly because of hostility toward the church. There is a hostility toward the church. We all know it. And in fact, this colors people's statements and judgments. They're not gonna, they don't want to give the church credit for things. My own theory is that one of the reasons a lot of secular intellectuals despise the church is that the church, in effect, reproaches them for their immoral lifestyles. They don't like being told they're not supposed to do this and that. And every time they see the church, it's a reproach to them. And so therefore, they have to wipe it out. They have to destroy it. They have to ignore it. But we refuse to go away, don't we? We refuse to go away. Well, after the break, we're going to talk about the state of Western civilization right now. Look around at the art world a little bit, the state of things, and see what, if anything, we can do about this. And what can we do to take this knowledge and spread it out there to the world. I wrote a book called How the Catholic Church Built Western Civilization because I hoped it could help to spread this knowledge among the general population. Let's see what else we can try to do to make people aware of what an extraordinary treasure the world has in the Catholic Church. Supernaturally, yes, but even on a natural level, all the glorious things she's done. How do we spread that around? Let's talk about that after the break, and we'll see you in just a minute. Welcome back to the Catholic Church, Builder of Civilization. I'm Thomas Woods. Today we're sort of summing things up and then looking forward. We're looking at things the church has done in the past and then thinking about what are we going to do in the future? What are we going to do to redeem Western civilization? Build it back up again to where it belongs. Now, I think if you were to take a quick glance, for example, at the world of art today, it's probably not fair to say all of modern art is just a complete disaster. Uh, I don't think anyone would really say that. However, I think we can say that there seems to be a relationship between a civilization's view as to whether there really is a transcendent, there's something that is beyond our experience, and a civilization that doesn't believe that, that believes in materialism. Materialism, in this sense, doesn't mean greed. It means believing that matter is all there is. If, if something isn't physical, then it doesn't exist. That's what materialism teaches. And it seems to me fairly obvious that the type of art you would see in those different types of civilizations would differ from each other. And this is a point that Jude Doherty made. He's the Dean Emeritus of the School of Philosophy at the Catholic University of America. And he's made this point. He asked the question, could a great Gothic cathedral, or indeed Gothic architecture in general, could that have been built in a materialistic culture? And likewise, could some of the hideous things 
that we see around us all the time, what Doherty calls Lego set architecture, we're surrounded by everywhere, would that have been built in an age and a culture that believed in the transcendent? When you, in effect, when you believe in materialism, what you're saying is that there is no meaning to life. If all there is is matter, matter if matter is just dead, it has no purposes, then there is no meaning to anything if there's no transcendent. And if you really believe that life has no meaning, it would be a miracle if that belief weren't in fact reflected in your art. And we see that. Of course, we see that everywhere. Now, I suppose it's shooting fish in a barrel to criticize some of the excesses of modern art, so I'm not going to do that. There's a little bit of that in my book, and you can find that all over the place. But I do remember walking into my classroom back in the years when I was a professor in New York, and I had a newspaper article, and I said to them, this is a Western Civ course, I said, ladies and gentlemen, I want to update you on the state of Western civilization. And I read to them this news item, and it was a news item about the Turner Prize exhibition uh, in England, which is a prestigious uh, art prize. And one of the exhibits was called The Lights Going On and Off. And in this exhibit, the artist, so-called, flicked on the lights, flicked on and off the lights of the facility. And this produced an interesting effect, apparently, and that was his work of art. Hmm. I know what you're all thinking. I can flick lights and on and off, too. I, kn I know. I'm thinking the same thing. Also in recent years, at major prize competitions, more than once, the janitorial staff has mistakenly thrown these art exhibits in the garbage, assuming that they were trash. What does that say to you about the state of the civilization? Now, if we Catholics don't defend ourselves, as I said at the beginning, nobody is going to do it for us. We've got a glorious civilization behind us. We've produced some extraordinary art that is admired by people all over the world. Now, it's true, though, that we're not Catholics because we produced great art. We're not Catholics because the church helped to foster the university or because the church encouraged the sciences. These are all wonderful things. That's not why we're Catholic. But there are a couple of benefits that come from knowing this information. And the first one is that a lot of people do believe a lot of negative things about the church, don't they? A lot of people believe these negative things. So if we can show them that they're mistaken, that in fact a lot of these misconceptions are exactly that. They're just misconceptions without historical foundation. We will have struck down an obstacle to their conversion. So it is important to know this knowledge, even if it's not the reason that we're Catholics. It will help us when we interact with people who have deeply embedded prejudices. But remember, Nobody's going to defend ourselves if we don't defend us. We have to defend ourselves. We have to be prepared to tell people these things when they come up and say the church has been nothing but a blight. We have to have an answer for that because they're not going to have the answer. We need to give them that answer. But secondly, these things help to confirm our own faith. And what I mean by that is that we should expect Christ's church to bear such wonderful temporal fruits because if the church really is what she claims to be, she's the bride of Christ, she's a divine institution, then naturally we would expect her